Amen. If you could stand to your feet today. And we're going to read uh, Luke chapter 24. And the title is, He Lives. He Lives. Amen. Uh, we can read together. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found a stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You got to watch your conversation because Jesus is listening. But their eyes were restrained and they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened in those days? And he said, what things? So he said, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people who was a prophet, they got it wrong right there, uh, and how the chief priests and our uh, the elders delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find the body, they came, saying that he had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And certain of those with us, went to the tomb and found that just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to not one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very same day and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those uh, with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still not believed for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things might be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and, and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Old Testament to New Testament, that is one message, and that is Jesus. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance 
and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. The church has to come back to the message of the gospel. Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, and you're witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in, in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, I give, this, I give this message to you today, and um, I just pray for open hearts to receive it, and I just thank you, Father, that, um, that I give this message today in the fear of God. I pray you be glorified, Lord. I pray that you will confirm your word with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message is, He Lives. Verse 4 to 7 says, As it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about it, the behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. On that Easter morning, the angels had won, or rather on that resurrection morning, the angels had one message for mankind. He lives. And so the men in shining garments asked the women at the tomb, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. They were simply saying, he's not dead. He is risen. On the road to Emmaus, after Jesus met the disciples and revealed himself in the breaking of bread, they sent word to the others, he lives. And when he stood in the midst of his disciples, still freshly traumatized after what they had seen in the crucifixion and everything leading up to it, and as they stood there in awe, terrified and frightened, and yet in spite of all that they had seen and experienced, they could conclude only one thing. He died, they had seen him die, and yet he lives. For in spite of the fact that they had seen him suffer and bleed and die, and in spite of having a spear driven deep into his side and being taken off the cross dead by the Romans who did not make mistakes when it came to this issue, and uh, and subsequently laid in a cold, dark, silent tomb. But now, contrary to everything that they had seen and heard, they could not deny what they now saw with their very own eyes. He lives. Jesus lives. And we have one message for a lost and a broken world that is so confused so confused about the most basic of things. He lives. He lives. Jesus Christ lives. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same because he lives. Hell could not hold him. Death could not conquer him. Satan could not stop him. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. That is the gospel message. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. John to the seven churches which were in Asia. Grace to you and peace 
from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forevermore. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 13, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like um, fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he has in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went the sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand to me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives. I am he who lives. And was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And so, Jesus Christ is alive. Muhammad is dead. Lenin and Marx are dead. Caesar, Napoleon, and Nietzsche are dead. Joseph Smith of the Mormons and Charles Russell of the Jehovah's Witnesses, dead. Osama, Osama bin Laden and Michael Jackson, dead. Kings, philosophers, priests, gurus, celebrities, warmongers, despots, dictators, terrorists, princes and paupers, celebrated and unknown, savage and cultured, saints and sinners, none were able to escape the power of death and the grave. Because Jesus Christ is the only one who overcame death. And so you can follow who you want to follow, but I'm going to follow Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Job 19 and verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. The NIV says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Do you know that your Redeemer lives? Do you know that He lives? I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. I myself shall see Him with my own eyes. Uh, I am not another, though how my heart yearns within me. Do you know that Jesus lives? Because when you do, it changes everything. Sin loses its hold and fear loses its grip when we discover that Jesus Christ lives. You know, Paul had this glorious revelation on the road to Damascus when he encountered Jesus and he was never the same again. Because he saw this bright light and he heard a voice and he said, um, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus is so one with his church that when Paul was attacking Christians and throwing them in jail and causing them to be killed, Christ felt it personally. He is personally identified with his people. And this is why we must not give in to fear irrespective of how crazy the world is becoming because no matter what is going on or what is going wrong you are not alone he is the same yesterday today and forever and he is one with his people and this is why he said to Saul why are you persecuting me Jesus said I am Jesus he did not say I was he is a living savior. Paul knew from personal experience that Jesus lives. He lived for this truth and ultimately died for this truth. Acts 25, 19 in the Amplified. Instead, they had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about one Jesus, a man who had died, but whom Paul kept asserting and insisting over and over to be alive. Paul, what was Paul's message? Jesus is alive. 
Paul wasn't trying to impress them with his knowledge or build his ministry by talking about the great miracles or or the revelation, um, the the miracles he had seen or the revelation he had been given. He simply wanted them to know one thing. This Jesus that I speak to you is alive. Acts 17, 23. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. You see, Jesus Christ lives. Acts chapter 2. And verse 36, what was Peter's uh, message? Peter said this, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter was saying, Jesus was crucified, but God has raised him. He is alive. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. And it says, And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat in the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders um, uh, fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You know, the Bible says that God, you know, uh, we, we value silver and gold. You know, God shows us what he thinks of gold because the Bible says the streets of heaven are paved with gold. But what is precious in God's eyes are our prayers. It says the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to open the scroll and to uh, open its seals. Because for you were slain and you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Isn't it beautiful? We got people here today from Romania and Poland and Lithuania and Ireland and Great Britain and America and, and, and you know, Venezuela and Brazil and, and uh, India and, uh, come on, uh, think of Uganda and, and B- B- Botswana, Argentina and, and Kenya and we have people here from uh, Uganda, South Africa, Nigeria. Come on, is there anybody from Nigeria in church today? Uh, we, we got some people from Croatia. We got people from so many different nations gathered together because this is a little taste of heaven. Amen. How could I forget my, my Filipino friends? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. But um, it says, and I looked. And they sang a new song, you're worthy to open the scroll. For you've redeemed us out of, uh, by your blood, out of every tribe and people and nation. And made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures, the elders and the numbers of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands sing with a loud voice. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. To receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And such are in the sea and all that are in them. I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits in the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. No matter what is going on or what is going wrong, God is always worthy of praise. Come on, just give him praise. Give him praise. Come on, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down before him who lives forever and ever. You see, the Bible says that he has redeemed us to God in verse 9. He has redeemed us by his blood. And, and, and this is why Jesus is the lamb that was slain and yet he lives forevermore. We just read it there in Revelation chapter 5 verse 14. That it was a lamb as if he was slain and yet he lives forevermore. And so... I just have a, three points and I'm going to quickly go through them. The first one is this. One, he lives, my past is gone. He lives, my past is gone. It says he has redeemed us to God by his blood. He redeemed us to God and our past no longer exists. It's gone. It only exists in our minds or because others still remember. You see, Jesus bore our burden of sin, dying in our place, arising victorious over death, hell, 
the grave and sin and Satan, and he is alive forevermore. This is the glorious gospel. We serve a living Savior. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Here we have the story of Peter's denial. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, that your faith should not fail. And when you have uh, returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you'll deny three times that you know me. Verse 54. Having arrested them, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Don't be a believer that's following Jesus at a distance. Invariably, you're going to get into trouble. Don't be a Christian that comes to church, you know, every, every two or three weeks or once a month. Or you're just, you're just following God at a distance. You're going through the motions. No, uh, no, my soul follows close after you, the Bible says in the book of Psalms. We need to pursue him. And anyway, Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat together, Peter sat down with them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as they sat by the fire, looked intently and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another um, saw him and said, You also are with him. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow is with him, for he's a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And the Lord remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. The Lord looked at Peter. Can you imagine what that look did to Peter? Because Peter was stuck in a nightmare that he couldn't get out of because he had failed Christ in his moment of need. The pressure came on and Peter crumbled. How many of us have been in the very same place? You know, we make all kinds of promises to God that we subsequently break. But for Peter, it was over. It was too late. He was now defined by failure and cowardice. He was going to be forever de defined by denial. And he couldn't take it back, re re redress his actions, or ask for forgiveness because Jesus was dead. Because they had seen him, uh, uh, they'd seen them nail him to a cross. They, he, he had seen him breathe his last and die. And, and so this rough, tough fisherman who had once shown so much promise and had been shown so much grace by Jesus was finished. Because if Judas was a betrayer, Peter was a coward because he abandoned the one man who believed in him and nothing could change what had happened. It was like a nightmare he couldn't wake out of. He was living, but in a way he was already dead. His tombstone was already carved. His, his legacy already written. His reputation in tatters. But the resurrection changed everything because grace was still calling Peter's name. Mark 16 and 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. Now go on, the NLV, now go and tell his disciples, including Peter and Peter and John and Joanna and Mary and Evelyn and Naima and Alex and Rafa and Mary and David and Pablo and Julio. My name is Julio, and I'm here. <laughs> Julio. It's, that's a cool name. It's kind of something gangster about that. Um, <laughs> Grace always includes you. Grace embraces you and sets you free. You know, if the Gospel of John were a play, and I, I've, I've written a few, but if it were a play, here are some of the scenes I would include based on the chapters. Opening scene, the eternal word and the voice in the wilderness. Uh, scene two, water to wine. Three, the new birth. Four, a woman at a well. Five, a man healed at the pool of Bethesda. Six, 5,000 fed. Seven, disciples walk away or fall away. Eight, a woman caught in adultery. Nine, a blind man receives his sight. Ten, the good shepherd. Eleven, Lazarus raised. Twelve, anointed at Bethany. Thirteen, Jesus washes the feet of his followers. Fourteen, a helper is promised. Fifteen, abide. 
16, a helper is described. 17, Jesus prays for us. 18, betrayal and arrest. 19, Jesus is mocked, flogged, and crucified. 20, the empty tomb. The empty tomb. But amazingly, the gospel of John does not end there. How many of you know there's a chapter 21? Even though it could have ended in chapter 20 with the resurrection and the, you know, the risen Christ, there is an epilogue of sorts where God ties together all the loose ends. And you know what? We have a chapter headed, generally most Bibles say a breakfast by the sea or you know, something in that direction. And um, it almost seems, in light of everything that had happened thus far, it almost seems like an anticlimax. If you read through the Gospel of John, chapter 20, um, it seems that way. Because rather than finishing with a, a brave heart speech to his followers, you, you have a breakfast by, by the sea. Because with God, it's always about relationship, not religion. So you have this personal touch where Jesus sits down with the disciple who had denied him three times. John chapter 21, verse 15 to 19. And so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him this third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You know, it's interesting when you look in the Greek, um, you know, the, in, in verse uh, 15, uh, where he said, feed my lambs. That word means pasture, fodder, graze, feed, or keep on. And in verse uh, 16, when he said, tend my sheep, that means to tend as a shepherd, to feed or to rule. And it comes from the word for shepherd or pastor. And you know, to a man who felt like he was utterly disqualified, here Jesus says, I'm placing you as the leader of this fledgling church. I still believe in you Peter and not only that even though Peter had denied Jesus three times three times Jesus gives him an opportunity to confess him rather than deny him and and you know that's the way God is because sometimes you know we, we swing and we miss and we we swing and we miss and we swing and we miss and we we drop our shoulders and we realize you know three times that's it it's it's over and the Lord says swing again Come on, swing again in Jesus' name. Try again. Go again. Get up again in Jesus' name because God believes in you. And he proved that by sending Jesus. Peter discovered to his delight, he lives, he loves, and my past is gone. Oh, what that must have meant to Peter. It, like I said, it may still exist in, the mem in, in, in our minds or in the memories of others, but in God's eyes, it never happened. Hebrews 10, 17. Then he said, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. The Amplified, and their sins and their lawless acts. I will remember no more, no longer holding their sins against them. You see, the first point is this. He lives my past is gone. Isaiah 38 and 17. You have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. And you have cast all of my sins behind your back. And again, Isaiah 43, 25. And it says, I even I, I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. We have no right to remember what God has chosen to forget. How many of you know the devil loves to bring up your past and make you feel shame and embarrassment over where you failed? And sometimes it's things from years ago. Well, you know, again, we have no right to remember what God has chosen to forget. Sin cannot hold us and Satan cannot have us because we are new creatures in Christ 
Jesus. He lives. He lives. Our sin is forgiven. Our past is buried. And it's time to walk out of the grave. Luke chapter 11, verse 43 and 44. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But I love this because it says... Um, uh, now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. You see, we get born again, we get saved, but we still have the grave clothes of our old life. Sometimes we carry those hurts, those offenses, that bitterness, that secret sin, those issues, those, those areas of dysfunction or pain or brokenness. And the Lord doesn't want to leave you where you are. Yes, you're saved, but now there's a process of sanctification. That's why, again, join a life group. Get into Bible school. Renew your mind with the Word of God so that you think differently. Because you're not going to live differently until you think differently. In Jesus' name, loose him and let him go. You see, it's time to let go of the old life. It's time to put off the grave clothes of our past and let God liberate you from shame and condemnation. Allow him to work in your heart and in your home because salvation is a promise, but sanctification is a process. We get saved in a moment, but we become sanctified over a lifetime. And it starts with us believing that because he lives, we can live too. Romans 8.1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Christ has made you free, but you need to believe it. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. 1 John 3, eight, um, for this reason the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. God wants to destroy the works of Satan in your life because Christ conquered sin, Satan, and the grave. And you might, feel, you might feel I can never get free from this habit. Yes, you can because you might not be able to defeat it in your strength. But the Bible says my heart might fail, my strength may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He is your strength. He is your deliverer. And he declares you are free in Jesus' name. Jesus was born to die and died that we might live. And because he lives, we live. Matthew 1, 21. And she will bring forth the son and you will call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. I don't know where you're struggling or what's going on or what's going wrong, but Jesus Christ is still mighty to save. He lives. My past is gone too. He lives. My future is bright. Now in the natural, sometimes we can be tempted to despair. When we see the confusion, the insanity, and the darkness and depravity of our times, you know, I think it's an indication of where we're at that Easter weekend, the weekend where billions of Christians all around the world are celebrating the resurrection of Christ, our city council choose to put those stupid flags all the way up the keys. First thing in the occupying army do is they put up their flags. We live in times where we're seeing the normalization of evil. How many celebrities are doing these satanic rituals and acts in their videos or on the stage because they want to influence the masses and in particular the younger generation? And some of you might be offended by me talking about those flags, but let me tell you something. I, don't, I believe the castration of children and the confusion of children is wicked and evil and the church needs to rediscover their voice. Because God says, woe, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Who put light for darkness and darkness for light. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. People talk about being on the wrong side of history. I want to be on the wrong side of eternity. I want to be on the, on the right side of eternity. I want to be on the right side of God. Say what you want. I'm going to stick with what the word of God says. You know, this week we had Limerick City Council decided in their wisdom that they're going to cut all cars in Limerick, the number of cars in Limerick, in half by 2030. 
Because how many of you know there is a globalist agenda to set in place a system that will really, in essence, enslave mankind? You know, Henry Ford didn't invent the car. What he did was he made it available to the masses and they will never forgive him for that fact. Because it's not about a car, it's not about a plane journey, it's not about, you know, CO2 emissions, it is about freedom. Freedom to live your life as you choose without people dictating to you how you live. That is it, it's freedom, that is a sacred thing. That is the, the gospel message, the core issue is freedom. He causeth all to take a mark on their hand. That no one may buy or sell except he who is the mark. The Antichrist system is about control. Autocratic control. And we are seeing that pervading our society in so many issues. So many of our governments and our institutions have been ideologically captured. Because the issue really is about control and it's about depopulation. Many people are just you know, useful idiots who have no idea about the big picture. But if you read the Bible and you know how this ends, you've read the last chapter, you know how this ends, and when you know the destination, it's easy to see why they're doing what they're doing, even though many who are doing it don't even understand why they're doing it. And so in light of that, you might say, Pastor John, what a strange point, my future is bright. Well, that is because as Christians, we have a, a biblical and a redemptive perspective that even if we have to suffer, and even if we have to suffer the stupidity of people who are passing laws and making changes that are going to, is going to make life very difficult for many people because ultimately this whole idea of net zero is about the impoverishment of mankind. You look back a few hundred years, everybody aside from the aristocracy lived in, in poverty. Fact is, in many of, these, many of our societies, you, go back, uh, you don't have to go back too far. And if you are 40 or 50 years old, you are an old man or an old woman. And so we should not be naive and we must be in prayer. We must be in prayer and not just accept everything as fait accompli and there's nothing we can do. Yes, there are things we can do. Yes, there are things you can pray, you can get elected. You can, you know what, if, if, if our politicians aren't going to change their policies, we need to change our politicians. Anyway, he lives, back to the main point, he lives, my future is bright. The Irish are not renowned for optimism, and as you can see, I'm Irish to the core. Um, and maybe our tragic past, our tragic past played a part in feeding that negativity. And it's something I sometimes have to battle. Um, <coughs> and, uh, you know, it's nothing like the Irish to always <coughs> look for an opportunity to blame the English. Um, <coughs> but anyway, uh, it was the Irish playwright Brendan Behan who said, if it was raining soup, the Irish would go out with forks. Thank you, darling. Uh-uh. <coughs> And it was the Irish poet, W.B. Yeats, said, Being Irish, he had an abiding sense of tragedy, which sustained him through temporary periods of joy. <laughs> if English is not your first language, forget it, just forget, you're not going to get it. But um, this is the wisdom of natural man without the Holy Spirit. Expect the worst, and you won't be disappointed. But God says differently. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Yes, the WEF have plans. George Soros and all of these various WHO, UN, all of these global entities who are seeking to create a one world government, they have plans. But God says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil to give you hope in the future. You see, Sam too says, uh, you know, God sits in the heavens and he, he laughs. 
He laughs at their plans. He laughs at their agendas. He laughs at, at these people who are sold out to Satan and want to destroy mankind. He laughs. Why? He sits on the throne. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. That is the message of the gospel. He lives. And because he lives like the old song goes, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Come on, give a shout of praise to the Lord. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. It's time for the fighting Irish to come out in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're on in this nation, I don't care what nationality you are, the fight has to come out in you as well in Jesus' name. Come on. Glory to God. God's called us to fight. He lives. My future is bright. Many of you have an eschatology of negativity rather than one of victory. But this is not how it ends. Jesus is coming back for a victorious church, not a fearful, defeated church, begging to be taken. And he is certainly not coming back for a woke, compromised church. We are going out with a shout, not with a whimper. Fact is, let me tell you this. The devil is the one who is going to be begging for us to be taken out because we will be taking over in Jesus' name. Yeah. Oh, oh, pastor, that's, that's Christian nationalism. Listen, better than secular nationalism or Islamic or LGBT nationalism, though these people enforcing their worldview. No, I believe the church needs to wake up and realize that we need to elect people that fear God and that will honor the truth and that will be working in our interest, not in globalist interests. Amen? Glory to Jesus. And if they won't, we need to replace them. So anyway, eschatology, you might say, what? Well, that's a big word. It's the study of death, judgment, the rapture, the return of Christ, the millennial reign, and the end times in general. And so you could say it's your views or beliefs about the end times. And yet many believers have been badly taught. And like I said, they have an eschatology of negativity. Oh, the devil's taking over. Oh. It's, it's an eschatology of of negativity and not victory. And thus, they are bought into this blind fatalism that simply plays dead in the face of darkness. One that throws its hands up and says, oh, what's the use? It's, it's, it's over. Oh, all is lost. No, it's not. You are not lost. Neither am I. Glory to God. We belong to Jesus. And so, as Christians, we are called to defiance, not compliance. That's why before that vote, we came out publicly and we did videos and we put it out there and we said, you know what? We need to keep women in the constitution because the concept of male and female is a building block of society for millennia and any idiot who thinks he knows better and can disregard the last five or six thousand years of recorded human history and says, hey, we got a better idea. There's 75 genders. That is an idiot. And for our dear translators who are translating into Russian and uh, Spanish and uh, uh, Portuguese, apologies, I'm going to try and keep it together. But anyway, there you go. Um, thank you, Jesus. We're called to defiance, not compliance. At least not compliance with the spirit of this age. We're, but we're not only called to defy, we're called to occupy. Luke chapter 19 and verse 13, he called his 10 servants and afterwards delivered to them 10 pounds and said to them, occupy till I come. Jesus did not say, go find a cave and hide away or go, go buy dried food online or, or, or just, you know, just, just b become this timid, uh, inhibited person. No, he said, occupy till I come. We're called to occupy. That means we're called to start businesses, buy homes, get married, have children, get promoted, get elected. Change policies, change politicians, love people, win souls, and disciple nations. This is why our future is bright. We are intentional. We are not little sheep, you know, that we're going to allow, you know, uh, those with their, their, you know, demonic agendas to, to just manipulate us and to brainwash our children and to put us into a corner and just box us in and make our societies open prisons. Hell no, in Jesus' name. No. It's not about a car. You don't understand that. It's not about a car. It's about control. 
They'd want you having the freedom to decide, you know what, I'm going to go across to this side of the country or I'm going to go abroad for a little bit of sunshine because I'm vitamin D deficient because I hasn't, we haven't seen the sun in like six months. You know, but no, these new things are climate sins. And it's really no different to the, to the Middle Ages where you had people, you know, you know, trying to bite their way into heaven and trying to virtue signal their, their, their goodness by, you know, obeying whatever they were called to do. No, we are called as Christians to defy the spirit of the age. Yes, we respect those who are in government. Yes, we understand what Romans 13 says. However, there is a point that you cannot cross. There is a line drawn whereby, like the disciples who said, we must obey God rather than man. And so when man is telling us to do things that defy our conscience, that defy what the word of God says, such as you know do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together you know during COVID we gathered at the cross to worship God because we believed and it was at the Easter when I decided I said you know I can't have a second Easter where we don't gather to worship Christ because he's worthy of praise and you know what I defied the authorities and guess what God didn't strike me down This is why our future is bright. No matter what happens, we don't buy into the negativity and the despair that is prevalent in the hearts of so many people who say, oh, the devil's taking over. No, he's not. We are. Hebrews 7, 22. But because of this oath, Jesus became the guarantee of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. The NLV says he is forever, uh, he lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. You see, Jesus is interceding for us. And as he said to Peter, I've prayed for you. So how can you fail when you realize that Jesus is praying for you? You know, Luke 21 talks about man's hearts failing them from fear. And it talks about the distress of nations, nations in perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Man's hearts failing them from fear. And, you know, the Bible talks about 2 Timothy 3.1, perilous times will come in the end days. And these are the days we are in. The Bible does not hide the fact that we will face challenges in the end days, but it does promise us victory in them. Jesus said in John 16.33, in this world you will have tribulation. That's the same word as relating to Revelation when it talks about the great tribulation. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And you see, because he lives, we can face tomorrow without fear. So bring it on, devil. God is in control. I am more than a conqueror. I'm destined to win. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God has only one thing for us as children of God, and that is victory. Your future is bright because you're called to win. Isaiah 41, fear not for I'm with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. You see, Jesus is alive and all fear must go. That's why 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. That is why Satan works night and day to fill your heart with fear. He attacks your mind. He gives you images of you dying young or this going wrong or that going wrong. Look what's happening here. Look what's happening there. No, we can, we can maintain a, a, a godly perspective of realizing, you know what? Yes, there's crazy things in the world, but you know what? I belong to Jesus. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And that is why if you feel fear, if you have fear in your life, if you have panic attacks, you're waking and not afraid. Listen, you need to realize that's the devil at work. God does not want you to be afraid he hasn't given you a spirit of fear and if you feel fear say go in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Jesus is alive and all fear must go don't give in to fear because God's not dead he's alive if he's brought you to it he'll bring you through it in Jesus name you don't face your problems or your trials or your future alone your future is bright because God's got your back Times are tough, but God is good. His love is real. His mercy is everlasting. You can't fail. And 
whatever is going on, God's going to turn it to your good. What the enemy meant for evil, God's going to turn to your good. He lives, my past is gone. He lives, my future is bright. Give me three or four minutes. And uh, Jill, Jill, wherever you are, you're not allowed. You're not allowed. That, that's, that's my saying, right? <laughs> but third, he lives, my past is gone. He lives, my future is bright. And lastly, he lives, my eternity is settled. Ask people this simple question on your job. In your family, even on the street, where will you go when you die? And along with the minority who assume or at least hope that there's nothing after death, the most common response you will get without fail is, I hope heaven. But that's like saying, I hope to, you know, win Ch Cheltenham, uh, you know, when I enter, or I hope to win the lotto. Um, yeah, you, you, you might win, but most likely you won't. And... Now again, don't gamble, but, but if you do happen to win, remember we have a building fund. <laughs> but all jokes, all, uh, Pastor Praveen asked me to put that into the message. I didn't. <laughs> all jokes aside, death and thus eternity is unavoidable. It's one date we will all be forced to keep. No matter how healthy or wealthy, no matter how powerful or celebrated, you cannot reschedule or cancel this date. It will happen because statistically it's proven 10 out of 10 people die. And so we instinctively fear and yet yearn for eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.1, it says God has set eternity in their hearts. We feel its weight at a funeral. Or as we consider how quickly our life has passed since childhood, I remember as an 18-year-old boy thinking how those 18 years, and I remember at 18 thinking I was old. <laughs> you know, today I'm 50 and I just look back at how quickly my life has passed. And it doesn't matter what age you are. You look back since your childhood how quickly time has passed. You know, eternity is a world we do not understand. And yet a part of us is deeply curious about what happens after death. Because deep down we know death isn't the end, but rather the beginning. Even the most educated among us would admit to being terrified by death if they were to be honest. And thus we use euphemisms like, she passed away, or he departed, or he, he passed. He expired. He, he shuffled off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare once said, or he cashed in his chips. But no matter how you put it, you can't soften its blow or evade its reality. Eternity terrifies man, but Christ gives us peace in life and even in the face of death. Psalm 91, you will not be afraid of the terror by night. You know, uh, Job 18 talks about Satan as they, they parade him before the king of terrors. Think about the kings and the rulers and the dictators. Think about the communist leaders who, who caused millions of people to die. You know, Mao with his great leap forward and millions of Chinese starved as a result. And that's why some of you necessarily don't understand. Pastor, why are you always banging on about climate change? You know what the two number threat, the two, the two biggest threats they see under climate change? Number one, agriculture. Number two, transport. Study history. You know, many of our peoples have experienced famine. And one of the biggest killers, historically speaking. And yet, they've come up with this idea that they want to just completely, you know, attack farming and uh, scale everything down. And, you know, of course, there'll be no consequences. No, listen, when, you're, when your agenda is depopulation, this is why you push trans. This is why you push LGBT on children. This is why you're going to arrange things so that there's going to be literally, you know, famines around the world as a result of your stupidity. When the agenda is the destruction of mankind... A lot of what they're doing actually makes sense. Agriculture and farming. How many of you know having food to eat is pretty important? Farmers are important. Being able to travel is important. But eternity. The Bible says Satan is the King of terrors. They parade him before the king of terrors. Two minutes and I'm finished. They parade him before the king of terrors. Think of all these people who 
espoused atheism, people who denied Christ, people who mocked Christ and Christianity. Think of the terror that grips that person when they take their final breath and realize they still exist. And suddenly their eyes are open to the spiritual realm. And they realize that they didn't come up with these ideas by themselves, but rather there were demonic entities whispering in their ears, there is no God. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There are no demons. There is no devil. And suddenly their eyes are opened and they realize it is all real. Pastor, why do you speak the way you speak? Because I speak in the fear of God, recognizing the time will come when I stand before my Creator. And I want to ensure that I did my best to make it as clear as humanly possible. You don't want to go to hell. When I was young, people say, well, I want to go to hell because Jimi Hendrix is there and there's a party going on. There is no party in hell. Jesus said it's a place of torment. It's a place of flame. It's a place of sorrow and regret and eternal darkness. Please. Am I on? Yeah, just during the week I had this dream. And I don't get an awful lot of dreams, but it was like there was just a lot of people. And they were trying to go through these doors. It was almost like it was the entrance into somewhere like... Uh, a show or a fairground where everyone was pushing to get through. It was like there was turnstiles and they were all trying to get through. And I found myself outside thinking, oh, I must go in because everybody's wanting to go in. What's going on inside? And once I got inside, it was like this just place just full of people. But then suddenly it was like there was a precipice and I myself started going down and it was like it was like high speed I can't describe it and everybody else behind me was just flying down through this I, it was like it was a bottomless pit it just kept going on and on and on and there was screams and there was terror and then I found myself I came out of it and I was back here and I I went back through those doors but there was just something about it that I I woke up and it was like it was just the reality of hell, that it is a real place. And these people just were just tumbling, stumbling and tumbling down. They, they thought they were going the right way. They thought, this is where I'm supposed to go. I, I'm going through these doors. But they didn't know what was on the other side. And I, I just wanted to share that. It was, it was just very, very real. You know, and I woke up and I said, why did I have to go down through that? Like it was, but it was like the Lord was showing me it's hell, you know, and I'm not going there myself. I ended up going back out there, but there's thousands, millions, I don't know how many people on their way. So respond this morning and Pastor John does the altar call. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, the world says that death is a leap into the unknown. But is it? You know, the Bible addresses the issue of eternity over and over again. And it warns us. It warns us because it presents the problem, our sin. But it also presents us the consequences of our sin, which is hell. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the Bible doesn't just present us with the problem and the consequences, it also gives us the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer to eternity. His death, his burial, and in particular, his resurrection offers us hope in the face of our mortality and the relentless march of death. Because let me say to all of these young people right now, those of you who are young, or rather those of us who are old, those of us who are old were once young. Now, I'm not, I'm talking about others. I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> and, and those of you who are young, hard as it is to believe right now, will one day be old. This is how it works. 
Life takes you by surprise. You, you see a, a little old lady walking around the road. One time she was a beautiful young woman. And yes, there's a beauty even in old age, but you, you get the point. And, and so we are young, we, we get born, we're young, we, we grow older, eventually we grow old and eventually we die. And, and it seems like a cruel joke. You know, George Bernard Shaw says, youth is wasted on the young. We see Christ gives us the promise of eternal life through him. John chapter 5 and verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but is passed from death to life. And so today as you stand to your feet, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your savior. Because the Bible says that when you receive Jesus, you pass from death to life. You pass out of darkness to light. And, and this is not something that just happens automatically. You must choose. The Bible says, I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. You know, the Bible says in the book of Amos, prepare to meet your God. Do you have life assurance? Eternal life assurance. Because this is what the Bible gives us. John 6, 47, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. This is why Paul was able to say in 1 Corinthians 15, oh death, where's your sting? Oh grave, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know every autumn and winter God gives us a warning? Because we are reminded of the cycle of life. As you look at those beautiful leaves as they grow brown and eventually as they fall off that tree. That's a sign. It's as if God is gently warning us. There is an end. But every spring and summer, we're reminded that there is a beginning or a rebirth. We look at the buds and we thank God. That, you know, the winter is over and that new life is returning. In the same way, we thank God that we can live because he lives. That we can rise because he arose. Martin Luther said this, Our Lord has written the promise of resurrection. Not in books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. And so as I finish, I want to read one last Bible verse. Colossians 3, as we look at that big beautiful cross right there, it says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You know, we all had a long list of sins and wrongs and failures. What we could have done, should have done, mightn't have done, what we did, etc. That list was nailed to the cross. And God wrote upon it in red, paid. He paid for our sins and blood. And so today I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart. I've done my best to present you with the claims of Christ on your eternal soul. He saved us because he suffered for us. This is why we can rest in his eternal promises. You can know today before you walk out that you are saved. You can know today that your debt is settled. That your eternity is settled. You know the great hymn writer Isaac Watts said, I believe the promises of God enough to venture an eternity on them. Peter put it this way. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. You have the words of eternal life. You see, Jesus and the Bible reveals to us the secrets to life and eternity. He lives so that we can now live. He lives. Our sin is gone. He lives. Our future is bright. He lives. Our eternity is settled. And so I want to ask you today, whatever your head bowed, every eye closed, is your eternity settled? Do you have that assurance that heaven is your home and that Jesus Christ is your Lord? What a day it would be today on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday for you to experience a resurrection. For you to have that assurance that Jesus is your Lord, that heaven is your home.
You might say, well, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved, you and your household. So if you don't have that assurance that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, but today you would like to surrender your life to him, put your hand up high and I'm going to pray for you today. God bless you. I see those hands. I see that hand. Come on, don't resist the Holy Spirit. If you know you're not right with God, but today you want to be right with him, just put your hand up high. I see that hand. God bless you.